Amen. Would you please stand with me for the reverential reading of God's Word? Open up your Bible to Numbers chapter 21, one of the first five books. Numbers chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Numbers 21, verses 1 through 9. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. If you have your iPhone or your Android device, you can follow along with you version, the Bible app. Numbers 21, 1 through 9. The king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard Israel was coming on the road to Athriam. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver these people unto my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they were utterly destroyed them and destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was called Hormah. Now here's where it gets interesting, verse 4. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Ouch. And the people spoke against God, and the people spoke against their leader, Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Wow. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you, Moses, our leader. And the Lord, and pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Watch this. Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be everyone who is bitten. When he looks, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. So it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when they looked upon the bronze serpent, he lived. Let us pray. Father, I thank you there are times in our life when you have us deal with the things that are dealing with us. I thank you for redemption. I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for your blood precious blood of your son Jesus. Lord, illuminate the scriptures this morning, Lord, so that we can walk closer with you, that we can walk in the truth and the light. I pray, Lord, that you would bring fresh revelation to the body of Christ this morning. Use me as your vessel, Lord, in the name of your son Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. We've been in this series called Hope for the Hard Cases. I pray you've been enjoying it. We've spoke about Mary's uh, addiction to busyness, uh, and and uh, um, or was it Martha? Martha's addiction to busyness, and Peter's lack of faith when he uh, apparently walked on the water then sunk, and then Israel going up against the Syrian army being outnumbered, where they found out God is the God of the valley as well as the mountain. And then we looked at the woman at the well, and she was a hard case. But nothing is too hard for God. I said nothing is too hard for God. In the passage we just looked at this morning, uh, the events occurred near the end of Israel's 40-year journey through the wilderness. And God delivered them uh, uh, dozens of years earlier, and it took them two years to reach the Jordan River. During that time, God gave them the law, the Ten Commandments. He taught them about worshiping him. And they arrived at the Jordan. They refused to cross over into the Promised Land. And because of their lack of faith and rebellion against God, the Lord sentenced the entire nation to wander in the wilderness and every member of that, what he called a rebellious generation, except for two people, Joshua and Caleb, it took them 38 years to pass away. That rebellious generation, God said to them, you won't come into the land of promise until that previous generation, minus Joshua and Caleb, until they pass away. So now, 38 years have passed by. During that 38-year period, God was faithful 
to walk with Israel, to feed them manna every day, to lead them from place to place, to protect them from their enemies. God is always faithful. The Israelites had grown sick of wandering through the wilderness. We don't like wilderness seasons. Come on, somebody. And they were tired of God's plan. Uh-oh. They were tired of the manna. They were tired of their leader, Moses. I hope you're not tired of me yet. They were just sick and tired of being sick and tired. We're told in the text they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to encompass the land of Edom in verse 4. They were forced to go the way of the Edomites because they couldn't get permission to go through the southern tier of the land. They were forced to walk through a very dreadful season, but necessary season. He sent them through a dry place. Have you ever walked through a dry place? Man, it's just no fun spiritually. The people didn't like what God was doing. And the Bible says in verse 4 and 5 that the soul of the people was discouraged. Have you ever got discouraged by what God is doing in your life? Can we be real today? The word discouraged has the idea in Hebrew of being something being shortened. They were short-tempered. They were frustrated. They were out of patience in the whole process of getting to Canaan. Their frustration over the path they were forced to walk brought the, to the surface the, the complaints they had in their hearts. Notice what God, God does. He forces us to deal with the complaints that are lodged deep down inside our hearts. And he does that by bringing us into a situation and circumstance to make us uh, miserable. Miserable. And when you are miserable, what's inside of you begins to break open. It becomes to the surface. God said, good, now we can really deal with what's in your heart. ¿Qué pasó? Okay, nada, okay. They complain that God and Moses brought them out of Egypt to have them die in the wilderness. They complain about the lack of food. They complain about the lack of water. They complain that the manna, this, this, this uh, angel food, if you will, that was falling from heaven, they got sick of it. Have you ever been around a complainer? Oh, ladies, look straight ahead. Don't do it. You'll get me in trouble. Manna, if you remember, was a miracle meal. It fell in their camp at night. It was plentiful. It was tasty. It was nutritious. It was a gracious gift. You know, sometimes pride creeps in our lives. And we take for granted the small things, you know. I mean, Rosanna, I, I look at the people in Venezuela suffering. And I think about no bread, no gas. And man, when I go home, I am surely going to be thankful for a roof over my head, Amen. gas in the car. And blessed, right? But how, how, how quick us as Americans, man, we get so, man, we get so, oh, oh man, it's the same thing for dinner tonight. You know, Mike just came back from Dominican Republic. Nancy, Wayne, Allison just came back from Mexico. We have a lot to be thankful for here. A lot to be thankful for. So now we're in the in place of Israel. They're complaining about everything, as my Jewish friend would say, Oy vey! We just begin to complain. But listen, in response to their complaints, God sent judgment in the form of fiery serpents. Yet, along with punishment came pardon. Well, that, that's it. Along with punishment came pardon. And this magnificent truth I want you to see today this passage that we read, Numbers 21, 1 through 9, is a picture of the harsh consequences of sin. It, but it also illustrates the love and the grace of God for those that are lost. The passage, although ancient, is a vivid illustration for what Jesus did for me and you on the cross. And watch this. When Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, just before John 3, 16, Ben, two verses before John 3, 14 and 15, he talks about this passage. Don't miss it. John 3, 14 through 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus, why are you making a reference to the serpent on the pole in the Old Testament 2,000 years earlier? What does that have to do with your conversation with Nicodemus, especially before the most famous verse in the Bible? What are you doing putting that in there? For years, Marie, I couldn't figure out this whole 
brass serpent thing until the Lord made me preach on it this week. And I want to share the revelation of what the Lord taught me. For Israel, the situation degenerated into a hopeless situation. They were being bitten by vicious vipers and people were dying. There was no treatment for the snake bites. There was no escape from the snakes. They were trapped in hopeless circumstances for which they could not escape. I personally don't like snakes. Jordan, no? I just don't like snakes. Anybody? I happened to watch Indiana Jones last week. And he's like, I hate snakes. And I'm like, I got to preach on snakes. For us to consider the facts, the passage teaches us once again, there is hope for the hard cases. Today we'll consider the case of the vicious vipers. The passage will teach us there is hope for those that are trapped in the grip of sin. There is salvation for those that are perishing. I uh, just got an email from Franklin Graham Wednesday night. As you know, they finished the California tour. Ten cities in California. They're going up to Oregon and Washington. I said, they're going up to Oregon, John, where Antifa is. I passed on that trip. Anyway, they're up in Oregon. Last Wednesday, 9,700 people at the crusade. Amen? Amen. 650 salvations. Amen? Amen? Continue to pray, folks, because they are processing right now about coming to Delaware. Remember next year, May, April, May, June. Please continue to pray and consecrate that in prayer. There's nothing more than I would like to see 10,000 people in front of University of Delaware and them throwing out the net and 500 people getting saved. Think about it. Continue to pray about it. Nothing is too hard for God. So three points this morning. I'll have you out of here to get to the Metro Diner by 12.10. I know that's where you're going. I saw your name on the reservation list. Three points. Point number one, the sin of Israel. Point number one, the sin of Israel. They, 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 they committed a grave sin against God. They rejected the person of God. Uh, the Bible says they, people spake against God. Listen, your arms are too short to box with God. The Lord didn't judge them harshly. Don't get the idea here that God is too insensitive. Don't think for a moment God is trigger happy and just waiting to judge so quickly the guilt and judge harshly. God does not wear his feelings on his shoulders. One thing that is people of Israel knew how to do was gripe and complain. They had done it for 38 years and they were draining poor Moses. The most challenging thing of being a leader, Jose, is when people start to gripe and complain constantly. Constantly. Until now, Israel had been guilty of speaking only about their leadership, Moses. But now they step into a whole other realm and they begin to shake their fist at God. Dangerous place to be. Can you imagine the audacity and the arrogance for these humans to speak against God before God chose them before God saved them by his grace they were nobodies they were nothing but common slaves in the land of Egypt so they rejected God's person but they rejected also God's promise here's what they said therefore you have brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness didn't God tell them I'm going to bring you to how I'm going to bring you to the land of milk and honey what did what did you forget such short short memory they had. God promised the nation of Israel he would bring them into the promised land. They had his word on it. God's promises are yes and amen. Yet they looked God straight in the eye and said imprudently, arrogantly, we don't believe you. Therefore they called God a liar. I don't believe God could provide. He's like, ay Dios mío. Why do you say that? Remember this. Every time you doubt the word of God, you discredit the worth of God. Every time you doubt the word of God, you discredit the worth of God. His promises are yes and amen. I'm going to stand on his promises. They will come true, folks. There is hope for the hard cases. There is nothing too hard for our God. And for those that trust and believe in his faithfulness and his grace and his mercy and his compassion, they're new every day. They rejected his person. They rejected his promise. 
He wants us in his word, folks. Psalm 138, verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple. I will praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all names. God's word is true. They rejected his person, they rejected his promise, and they rejected his provision. They add insult to injury. They said, there's no bread around here, and it's certainly not rye bread. There's no water. God said, Moses, speak to the rock. What did he do? He said, bam, 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 bam. The water came out of the rock. God said, Moses, I told you to speak to the rock. Speak, speak. Don't hit the rock. It's amazing. The Bible says, they said, we loathe this bread. God provided them with bread every day, and when they needed water, he gave them two, water, two words that are worth noting here. The word loatheth, lo, loatheth, it means to be disgusted by. God graciously gave manna from heaven. He used it to keep them fed daily, to keep them healthy. And they looked at God's gracious provision and they said, that stuff is disgusting. Have you ever gotten there? I went out, Janet and I bought that Wolfgang, Wolfgang Puck, the new steamer, right, QVC. I want to make some stuffed artichokes like mama used to make with the breadcrumbs and, you know. And so, first to try it out, I made myself a nice pot roast. I went out, I got the pot roast, the potatoes, this, that, put it on, put it on. Man, that, that thing was done in like 12 minutes. I was like, it can't, it can't be. I dumped it out on the table. I was like, then you come here. And she said, that's disgusting. <laughs> oh, yeah? Go to your room. You know. The value of a good old pot roast. I mean, it was amazing, delicious. I highly recommend Wolf, Wolfie's, uh, you know, steamer. But I'm, I'm making a point is that the appreciation value of what we have in America isn't where it should be, folks. And I was like, okay, what do you want, mac and cheese again? I was like, this is really good stuff for you. Anyway, this is where I make that analogy and a comparison for you to understand where Israel was. They were complaining about every little thing. Come on. The word light means worthless. They said, we don't want this worthless stuff. It was far from worthless. They were in the wilderness where the bread was a picture of Christ, their strength, their sustenance, and their very salvation. Without it, they would have starved to death. Yet the one thing they gave them life, they renounced. So you had Israel's sin. Number two, you have Israel's sentence. You have Israel's sentence. Because of Israel's rebellion, God sent judgment in the form of fiery serpents. The serpent, you know, is a symbol of what? Satan or sin. Right. Satan disguised himself as a serpent in the Garden of Eden. And throughout the Bible, the serpent is always a picture of sin, evil, rebellion against God. It's fitting that the Lord should send serpents among his people. Sin is like a serpent. Sin holds tremendous power over us. It's always there. It's in the depths of our fallen nature, waiting like a cobra to strike us and fill us with its deadly venom. If sin is allowed to sink its fangs into your life, it will coil itself around you until it chokes the life right out of you and it will not stop until it's destroyed you and everything you love. Now these serpents were dreadful. They were called fiery serpents, I believe, because when they bit, uh, these, 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 these were vipers from the Middle East, and when they bit, a, a, a heatful, sharp, striking, fiery pain would come into the place where they bit. The research on this says uh, swelling begins right away. There was discoloration at the site of the bite where flaming red and purple and dark blue, sort of like a really bad, deep black and blue. The victims would experience nausea, vomiting, and excruciating stomach pains, and they begin to get real thirsty. Dehydration would take place, and they would experience a liver and kidney mis misfunction from the toxins from the snake bite, and then many times diarrhea had set in, hemorrhaging in the form of nosebleeds, uh, or bleeding from the mouth and eyes. And let me tell you, the bite from this viper was not a quick death. It took three to four weeks to die from this. Here's the picture of the bite. That's a picture of a real viper bite. 
So now, Rosie, you could picture thousands of people in the camp getting bit by these snakes. And all of a sudden, their attitude changes. Lord! Lord! What's for, what's for lunch? Rattlesnake. Okay. What's the point? The point is, God is trying to teach us here that suffering follows sin. Surely as night follows day. The devil has tried to sell us the idea that it's too hard to be a Christian. Well, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the devil is a liar. Friend, the way of the Christian and following Christ is not hard. Proverbs 13, 15 tells us this. The way of the transgressor is hard. As hard as it is to say, lost sinners get exactly what they deserve. So do saints who wander off into sin's playground. So point number B, the serpents were, were, the serpents were, they were dreadful and they were deadly. We were told that much of the people had died. Isn't that just like sin? It thrills and it kills. The soul that sinneth shall, shall die, Ezekiel 18.20. It also says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. Again, in verse 6 of Numbers 21, many of the people died, and that's putting it mildly. People, people are dropping like flies all over the camp, folks. They're getting sick, and they're dying. There was no hospital, and even if there had been a hospital, there wouldn't have been enough people to treat all those who were sick. There were no doctors, and even if they were, they wouldn't have enough anti-venom to treat all the patients. It was a desperate situation. They needed hope for this hard case. People were dying everywhere, and it seems, Jay, like there was no hope in sight. What a tragic picture it paints of a lost sinner in his fallen condition. Left to ourselves, the lost sinner is hopeless. Helpless. Hopeless. He cannot change the situation. He cannot save himself for the poison of sin that flows through the veins. But that is why I rejoice in a tremendous thought that presents itself in this passage, boys and girls. Here it is. Even though a situation may be desperate, with God, it's never hopeless. With God, it is never hopeless. Israel's sin, Israel's sentence, and then all of a sudden, last and final point, Israel's salvation. The incredible cure for this serpent problem is not a pill or a potion. It is a brass serpent raised on a pole. There's some precious truths I want you to... I went and bought... Now, it's not real. We're not that kind of church. Uh-uh. Okay. I went and got a plastic snake. It's plastic. Don't go putting on the internet past the snake handling. We're not that kind of Pentecostal church. That's in Tennessee. Forgive me, Jesus. Okay, so he tells him, get up, get up. I, you know, I never understood this. 22 years as a preacher, I didn't understand this until I had to preach it. I finally understood it, Jorge. He says, go get a pole. It's a picture of the cross. Go get a snake. Make a brass snake. Put the snake on the pole. And when you look at the snake, when you look at the snake, you look at what bit you, that's what's going to cure you. I said, Lord, I don't understand. I don't get it. Lord said to me, Chris... When you come to Christ, you not only come to Christ, but you have to deal with the sin. So when you look at the cross, you must deal with your sin. The that, that which bit me will cause me to look at not only Christ, but it'll cause me to look at the cross. It'll cause me to repent and look at my own sin. Are you getting this? So God preconditioned the Israelites to make them look at that which caused the affliction. And New Testament revelation, that revelation comes in the New... We, we not only look at Christ, but we don't want no fake salvations. We need to deal with the sin that separates us from Christ. We have to repent, for there's no salvation outside of repentance. We have to repent, and repenting, we have to look at the sin which separates us from, now I get it. Do you get it? Okay, you sure? Okay. So it is the sin 
that God forces us to deal with simultaneously as we look to the cross of Christ for healing and salvation. We must deal with the sin. It's a picture of guilt. The, the serpent symbolizes brass. Brass in the Bible symbolizes judgment. It's a symbol of judgment being lifted up on the pole. Pictures a curse. Galatians 3.13. Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. Do you see anything strange here? That the cure for the serpent problem took the form of what caused the problem to begin with. It was the serpent that bit them, and it would be the serpent that healed them. But it was a precursor, uh, a precursor to, to us looking at the cross of Christ and dealing with our own sin. Well, the Bible says, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. We can't come to the cross initially in salvation and say, I don't have no sin, I'm good. Then there's no need for a savior if you're good. Because you can get there yourself. When you say, if I'm a sinner and I need to be saved by the grace of God, I not only embrace Christ, but I come to terms with the sin in my life. And I repent. Whew. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that you and I could be the righteousness of Christ. That means my sin was supernaturally imputed to the cross. When I accepted Jesus, God takes my sin off of me and he puts it around his son Jesus. Jesus is on the cross saying, Eli, Eli, la la sabatini, why do you forsake me? God wasn't turning away from his son. God was turning his head on the sin that his son had on him. Oh my goodness, this is so good. And then in exchange for that, the Bible says that you and I are cloaked with the righteousness of Christ. He don't see the old Chris Dito no more, thank goodness. He sees the new creation. And I don't have to be ashamed. I can confess my sins. I'll probably sin in Zingos later. <laughs> Someone will hit me in the back of the leg with the cart. <sighs> Say, Jesus, Jesus, forgive me. For the spirit of smack is coming upon me. <laughs> now, really, let's be, let's be honest. Come on, you work at the mall, right? That counter, right? At what's the, what's the name of the place? Nordstrom. Go visit Letitia at Nordstrom. <laughs> I'm telling you, you deal with some characters, amen? Like, you got to go in there, Letitia, and say, God, grace on me today. Grace, grace, <laughs> grace, grace, God. And that enables you to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, right? The, the only way, watch, I'm going to just do away with the notes. And So, in, in, in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden... The devil bit Adam and Eve because they were, the only way this thing, a snake is blind. It sticks his tongue out. By sticking the tongue out, it tests the dust particles in the air. The tongue is a particle tester. So when it sticks the tongue out, it's able to detect the dust that is being stirred up. And that's how it finds its prey. Come on. Right? If you and I are made from the, uh-oh, dust represents the flesh. So when you're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit, that good old serpent can track you and bite you because you're leaving a trail of dust, which is flesh. And he has the legal authority to bite you when you're walking in sin. But when you're walking in the spirit, you're living above the snake line. Come on, Jordan, you want to preach it? You're living above. See, I could go up the mountain. The higher I go up the mountain, the thinner, come on, Jordan, the thinner the air gets. There comes a place on the mountain at 5,500 feet elevation that the snake can't live because it's cut off from the oxygen. You and I need to live above the snake line. When you live in 5,500 feet and above, he can't bite you. Because your proximity to the Lord, it means you're walking close with the Lord Jesus Christ. He has no reach to get you. But you got to live above the snake line. So let's get back to salvation. We're just going to forget about the notes because I think the Holy Spirit wants to take a different direction. So 
They're in the wilderness. Go ahead. All these people crying. Rosie, two to three million people. They're all screaming. They're all getting bit by the snake. They're all getting bit by the snake. And Moses is going around going, hey, there's a solution. There's a solution. If you just get to the, get to the, the, the pole, the, the serpent, the, the brass serpent on the snake, the snake on the pole, if you just look at him, you'll be healed. I'm good. I'm good. I put a Band-Aid on. I'm good. I put some vaccination. I put a, I, I'm good, Pastor. I don't need to look at the snake. I'm good. People are dying. Going to hell in Delaware, Pennsylvania, Maryland. Going to hell in a handbasket. What are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? They're dying. They're, they're being bit by the snake. Sin is poisoning them. And what happens? You could go ahead, play it again. They're, they're crying out. And we're visiting them. They're going, hey, hey, you know what? I know the snake bit me, Inga, but could you go look for me? Could you go to church for me? Maybe if you go for me, that'll cure me. No, mama, 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 and grandma can't get you saved. You got to get to the cross for yourself. You got to get to the cross for yourself. And so, Janice, you can't go look for the kids. The kids got to find Christ for themselves. You can't put a Band-Aid on sin. That's not going to heal it. But that's what people do. I don't need, I don't need people are dying. I don't need the solution. Folks, we have the solution. We have Christ. We have the solution. We have the answer. We have the antidote. We have the way, the truth, the life. We got the word. We got the Holy Spirit. We got everything that God ever needs to provide us with. And it's about time we share it with the community. Woo. Salvation comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. I could give you all the scriptures. We need to do some evangelism courses, Bob. Wayne, we need to do some evangelism courses. We need to pe teach our kids how to share their faith. Simplistically. It doesn't have to be complicated. We need to be a soul winning church. And we do a great job at it. But God's going to challenge us to ramp it up. Man, we do great church. We got great worship. We got great ministry. We got good preaching. Next thing is saving souls, folks. Saving souls. Oh, pastor, it's going to be tough. Nothing's too hard for God. Nothing's too hard for God. When you walk that path that he sets you on, and you set your face like flint to the assignment God gives you, man, he will bless your path. He will order your steps. Man, i will be the last one. When I first started growing in the Lord, Jeremiah, I was like, evangelism. Oh, it's just, I'm a teacher. I know that. God stretched me beyond my capability. Help me understand the scriptures. Help me witness to people. Help me save people. Bring them to the cross of Christ. I still do it. I was on vacation witness, witnessing the people left and right, waiting for that God-appointed moment on the plane, on the boat, in the show. Folks, it's got to be individual. We have to be able to save people. We have to be able to invite them to things such as our tent meeting. I want to see them saved. I want to see people healed, right? Amen? Don't you want to see the Holy Spirit move in a mighty way? Right? But that's going to take our participation, not just our observation. I'm not trying to be harsh or cruel. I'm just trying to give you the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 15, how will they know unless they hear? And how will they hear unless they, are, they go and send, invite, witness, however you like to do it. Let's be a church that wins souls. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning as we just have no formal closing? I'm going to ask Pastor Ben to close off in some worship. And I'm just going to ask you to pray in the next two weeks. Is there someone that you can invite? Someone that needs to be saved? A family member, a co-worker, a loved one? Maybe someone has diabetes or, heaven forbid, thyroid cancer or something. And, and you have an opportunity to say, hey, you know what? I know you may think this is strange, but there's a healing evangelist coming in. And you know what? I still believe, you believe God can heal you? Yeah, I believe God can heal me. Well, then I'm going to pick you up on Friday or Saturday or Sunday, whatever date. And we're going we're to come and just experience.
the healing power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. God can do anything. Nothing is too hard for God. I've done this hope for the hard cases to let you know whoever that hard case is in your life, it's not too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. But God needs us to be his mouthpiece, his extension, his grace, his love, his compassion, his evangelist extended. It, it, it does take some of us out of our comfort zone, I know. But God will give you the words. And all you have to pray is simple. Lord, lead me to the person that you need to speak to today. Real simple. Let me say it again for the people over here. Lord, lead me to the person that you need to speak to today. Guarantee God will order your steps and you'll have a divine appointment. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you for the worship. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your goodness, your grace, your compassion, and your mercy. Lord, let us be a soul-winning church. Let us be able to share the love of Jesus with the community for everyone, Lord from officials to workers to college students, high school, middle school, and people in the gas station, Lord, anywhere we encounter people, Lord, allow us to be salt and light. Keep our hearts right with you, Lord. Let us keep short accounts with you. I thank you for this wonderful, robust body of believers. I thank you for their faithfulness. I thank you for their commitment. I thank you for their love. I pray, Lord, continue to pour into them so they can pour into your community. We thank you, we love you, we honor you, and we adore you in Jesus' name.